I don't care what anybody says. You're never going to stop learning. So any of these guys that pat themselves on the back that know everything, they're just foolish because it's always changing. You want to feel the difference. And when that rod tip is too stiff, that very subtle, different pull is indiscernible from those little taps. People go up, they don't see bass popping, they make a couple casts, they leave. But they don't take the time to try and figure out what's going on under the surface. You know, we'll sit there, do five of those drifts and not catch one fish and just go. They'll just keep going to the next spot, next spot. Right. Not me, I'm staying there. You know, you have that moment with all sorts of species of fish where you realize you are not the one that's got the upper hand in the fight. And I realized that very quickly. <laughs> uh, that fish, it, it took off and dug my rod tip right into the water. Hello and welcome to the Salt Strong live stream and podcast. My name is Rich Natoli. I'm the regular host of this Monday night edition and typically Friday morning podcast edition. And I'm normally joined by the lovely and talented Ed Gobo. Ed is probably sitting in his garage right now watching us as he is making jigs. And he's making jigs because he filled all of his orders except for his own. So he, <laughs> the tackle owner, the tackle store or tackle manufacturer owner texted me and said, I have no bucktails, zero bucktails to go fishing. And if you live in New Jersey, you know that fluke season opens up tomorrow. So he's got to work on that. So Ed, uh, I don't even know what to say, Ed. We'll, we'll have words when we're on the water. So uh, everyone, that's why he's not here. So blame him. Don't blame me. We're going to have a great show. I'm going to try my best to keep up with the comments as we go through this one. It can be tough when you're flying solo, but I'm going to do my best for you. Make sure that we get all the questions answered that are possible. Uh, and out of the people that are in the chat right now, we have Dave Person, Bill Deekhouse, Rob Widmeyer, GI Jigs. <laughs> that is a great name. GI Jigs, Larry Matzinger, James Flynn, MR Johnson, Tad Drummond, Crabbing and Fishing, James Flynn again, Participation Trophy, trophy KB, John Kern, Breeze Life TV, playing hooky with David and Giovanni Gargano. Good to see all of you and everyone else that's in there that has not chatted. I don't know that you're there, but uh, welcome. Welcome. It's uh, good to have everyone here. So we're going to roll really quick into this one. Um, as I mentioned, if you're in New Jersey, if you're in New York, fluke season is, well, fluke season, I believe, opened in New York today. So uh, good luck to all of you. Everybody in New Jersey, it opens tomorrow. Good luck to all of you. I will not be fishing the opener for the first time in years because the wind is just offensive. It's it's just ridiculous wind. So I'm sure the New York guys are already frustrated that uh, a lot of them probably missed the opening day up there. And a lot of New Jersey guys will be frustrated tomorrow. I'm going to be going out later in the week, at least twice this week. So I'll have some information on that coming up. But that's not what we're talking about tonight. We're talking bull redfish and we're talking Chesapeake Bay bull redfish. And we have Captain Steve Griffin on tonight returning to the stream. I'm going to add him right now. Captain Steve, good to see you. Good to see you too, man. Happy to be back. Looking forward to it. Yeah, I, I was telling Steve before we came on, I can't stop talking to my wife about uh, the bull redfish in the Chesapeake because I booked a trip with Captain Steve Griffin and uh, it's coming up in July and I keep telling her about it and she keeps looking at me like I'm nuts. Like I don't realize I've already told her the same things over and over and over and over again. And uh, I, I know I have, and I'm going to continue doing it. I'm just really excited about it. So before we dive in there, why don't you why don't you go through and give everybody an update on where they can find you, the name of your service, how they can contact you if they want to get a charter going with you. Yeah. You know, my wife says the same thing about me and I get to do it every day. I'm still like a kid in a candy store every time I go chasing these fish. But uh, I'm Captain Steve Griffin with uh, Griffin's Guide Service. Uh, you guys can find me easily on uh, Facebook and Instagram at Griffin's Guide Service or uh, my website's griffinsguideservice.com. I usually, uh, you know, if you want to get a hold of me, you can send me messages on any of those. Um, my email, there's a really good email platform that you can get to from my website that I always see. Sometimes I miss uh, 
Instagram messages for some reason, but yeah, the web, the uh, website emails always come through. All right. And where are you sailing out of normally? <clears throat> we are uh, sort of in the middle of Chesapeake Bay. So um, I run out of, you know, almost always Maryland ports, but I'm um, on the Western shore and I go all over really. We, we chase fish. So we're always going after the best bite and um, we'll move for that. Yeah. And that, that's the important thing, especially I believe when you're talking about these redfish, because they're not always going to be in the same place when you're going out to hunt them. Um, and you've added, since we last talked, you added another, you, you've increased your, uh, your fleet. Yeah. We've got a little bit more capacity now. Um, <laughs> I've had a good problem, but, um, these redfish trips, you know, they're only here for two months, a little over two months, um, in the Bay, in the areas that I target them at least. And, um, we've been booked, every day of the week since December on my boat. So I said, well, that's a good problem to have. And you yeah. know, everyone's still calling wanting trips. So I have also another very good, very fortunate to have a, uh, a mate and a best friend of mine who's worked with me and chased these fish for as long as I have. And um, maybe longer actually. And he's willing to jump on and, and come come run my second boat for me, which is a huge, he, he, he's a big part of the team now. So that's, it's epic to have him running my second boat. Now, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and I am going to be on the second boat uh, because we did not book before you were booked up for the year, but we are fortunate that we have the second boat and uh, your mate that's been with you all these years and figured out the fishery alongside you. So yep. I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be, it's going to be great. And it, it's the same exact boat, right? It's the same boat as the, uh, the original. Yeah. So I, I did so much work trying to find the perfect boat and platform for what we do, light tackle fishing in Chesapeake Bay. And um, I hit it and I got it. I, this boat was perfect. It's a uh, Sea Hunter. It's a 28 Sea Hunter Floridian. Um, so anybody that knows Sea Hunter knows they make a fantastic boat. And um, this thing is just so capable, rough water capable. It is uh, shallow water capable, but also is set up for sonar and electronics. So um, that when it comes to bull reds and finding these big schools of fish, that is a secret weapon that that I've only seen this sea hunter be able to do. So um, when I was looking at getting a second boat, I really didn't want to spend the money to get another sea hunter, but <laughs> I, I, you know, for the, the service that I like want to give to my clients and, and there's just no other, yeah, there's just no other boat that can come close. So yeah, we got another sea hunter. it's funny. You, you talk to different captains and, uh, you know, the, the boat is such a big part of the success and, you know, we've had Scotty sevens on and he's, he's like, I have the ugliest boat in the world but it works exactly the way that I need it to work for what I do. He has yeah. the really wide bow, which allows him to get up right on tight on top of uh, bridge structures and get up there with the client when they're jigging sheep's head off of the pilings and he can do it safely. Nobody's reaching over around anyone else. Like you see a lot of other people doing. And uh, it sounds like you're in the same position. You found what works and you're going to stick with it. It's uh, I, I, couldn't find anything better. Um, and I've seen how it works out there. We use it and it, it really does. We can run circles around m most other boats. Yeah. Well, I saw a video of your boat passing another one and it was like, it was standing still. You just, you just took <laughs> off and went. It's got, it literally has it all. The only thing it doesn't have is uh, fuel economy, which hurts my pocket a little bit, but yeah. I'm willing. It actually does very well. They both have twin 300, one has Yamaha's, one says Mercury's, but um, they do well considering it's a nine, 10,000 pound boat yeah. um, and all that horsepower. So I do, I do take it a little bit there, but other than that, there's no downfall. That's awesome. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting on there and uh, adding some of pictures of me holding the bull reds that I, I keep looking when I look at your site and your, your posts on Instagram and, and Facebook and everything. Now, We've talked about the big piece of equipment here. 
Now let's start kind of honing in a little bit on the smaller things. I'm going to talk the equipment first and let's go into some tactics. Uh, yeah. Now you have talked about this in the past, the, the type of gear that you use, but we have a lot of new listeners, a lot of new watchers. So why don't you go through specifically for these bull reds when you're going to be targeting them, what are the rod and reel setups that you're going to use? And then let's talk about the line, the leaders. And then lastly, we can talk about the the jigs and the, uh, the terminal tackle that you're using. Yeah, I use, um, it's all relatively light tackle. Um, I do up my tackle a little bit when we're targeting these bulls. I think they, the bull reds fight, you know, versus when we're fighting stripers, big stripers. I think these bull reds fight three times as hard as a pound for pound as a striper. And so we go, we do up our tackle a little bit to 5,000 size reels. I'm personally using um, Twin Power XDs, Shimano okay. Twin Power XD 5,000s. Um, I pair those with G Loomis Pro Blues. Um, it's a, it's a 15 to... 40 pound rod okay. it, it's it's not super heavy it's still very light in the hand you can fish it all day long if you wanted but but it has enough backbone it's a medium heavy and it has yep. enough backbone to really get, be able to fight these big fish and get them in uh, with no problem we run 30 pound power pro braid and i run a 40 pound leader okay you always, makes sense always use a nice cigar leader can't beat it all right, so you're using fluoro. Let me let me ask you this: Do you find that these bull redfish, when they're out in the middle, well, I'm making an making an assumption. Are you out in the open water, or are you coming up tight to structure and tight to land, or are you not going to answer that? General, generally, it's open water. Okay. All right. So, um, do you find any leader shyness out in the open water? Typically, the hardest part with these fish is finding them. Yeah. And when you do find them they need a Coke can if you throw it out there. Okay. So it, it, no, um, I use the nice leader for abrasion um, because when we do find the big schools of fish, the only time I think we really get cut off is when another, cause it's just craziness, right? It's yeah. Um, only time I really think we get cut off is if another fish cuts, actually cuts the braid. Um, okay. So it's but, like a striped bass blitz. You know, it's usually not right. going to be that bass that does it. It's going to be the 10 million other bass that it's coming through. Or but even running worse, through. these 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 redfish have such a, a hard mouth and they have, you know, more teeth. Like even a big, if if you've caught large stripers, you know that they have teeth and they will cut you up. The, yeah. It's more more teeth than sandpaper when they get big. And same with the reds. They they also have sort of teeth and they would tear you up. And they also tear up a leader. Or yeah. Well, it's a point of pride when you have this striper thumb. And uh, I, I'm assuming you're not doing that with the redfish, though. Oh, redfish do, do it worse. <laughs> redfish, redfish will tear you up. Oh, exactly. That's what I'm saying. You're not going to be sticking your thumb in there as quickly on a I large do. red. I'll do it. I'll do it. But, you know, I'm all, <laughs> I'm all scar by now. So. <laughs> yeah, you are you got all calluses all over the place. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> now, what are you using? All right. So 40 pound leader, uh, 18 to, or what is it? 15 to 40 pound test or 17 to 40. Now, what are you using for your terminal tackle on, on any given day? What's the first lure? I, well, first of all, I assume you're all artificial. Is that correct? All artificial. Okay. So when you go out there, you see, okay, I can see the indicators. We've got the reds right ahead of us right now. We're one mile out. Guys, get ready. Make sure what is on the end of those lines. I am, for those Pro Blues and Twin Powers, those rigs that I have strictly for redfish and, and will catch Cobia while we're out there too, I always have this tied on, on every rod. And um, different colors. I always use different colors. Yeah. But... What it is, is it's a one and a half ounce GI jig, which I saw he was on here. Yep. Um, Love that he makes, name. He makes amazing, amazing lures. And these have an HD hook on them. So kind of need that. You need a good powerful hook because we are putting some some pretty strong drag on those fish. So we want to get them in. It's all catch and release. So we want to get them in before they get too wore out and, um, and get them released. So 
this is my rig right here, this setup. This is actually a glow head, which is incredible. Uh, top secret stuff. You got to contact GI Jigs to get those direct. All right. Don't see them in the tackle stores much. But um, it's a one and a half ounce GI Jig HD hook. It is a seven inch Z Man diesel minnow. And I use the diesel minnows, they don't get torn up, they last. I mean, these lures. I had a couple of them last all year last year, you know, caught tons and tons of fish. So the reason I use this, we see them up high and we also see these fish down low on the bottom. Right. So I used one and a half and we typically see them in less than 40 feet of water. So I used the one and a half in case we see them on the bottom. I could run something a little bit lighter. This is a half ounce head with an HD hook. Yeah. But if I did that, I'd be limiting my my capability if I needed to get down low. So a one and a half ounce can get low. You can get right down to the bottom if you need, or you can rip it across the top if there is a blitz. All right. So let me ask you this. Um, and I'm going to compare it to striped bass fishing. And often what I find when you go out, you have a lot of activity on the top. Let's say they're busting bunker pods or menhaden or whatever anybody wants to call them. Yeah. And you head out there and you can see, you can typically see the size of the bass. So let's say you have bass that are maybe 27 to 32, right? So they're in, they typically travel in classes. What I often like to do is toss it out and get under them. And that's where I find often the larger class fish. Is that the same thing with the redfish? Do you have the bigger ones sitting on the bottom or are they all together? They are, well, they're all big. They, we don't, <laughs> we don't have... The smallest redfish we caught last year was 41 inches. Oof. So they are all big. And yes, we do get a variety out of like, you know, when we get into a big school of reds, we're talking thousands of fish. And if I've got six people on the boat, unless somebody really messes up, six people are catching a big redfish. It's, it's hard to miss. Okay. But they're typically... We do see a little bit different size. So now that I think of it, we might see some in the lower 40s, and then we will have a group, you know, we find them one time, one day, and we might find a bunch of upper 40s or even into the 50s inches, um, and they do stick together, but they are always 40 plus. Um, okay. They're always massive. You can't really get to the bottom. If you see them up top, you're not going to make it to the bottom. See, they're that's gonna... a beautiful thing right there. It just brought a tear to my eye. I... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are not finicky. They they are going to eat. They're fighting over it. They're aggressive. Um, we do throw top waters at them when we see them up top. Um, so catching a big bull red on a top water is incredible. Seeing multiple fish fight over a big top water. Oh, that's great. And and right here you have James Flynn. Loves that answer. They're all big. So <laughs> you had two really great answers there. They're all big. And the second is you're not getting to the bottom. It's, I mean, that's, that says it all. And, and what's interesting is, you know, I, I won't say nobody knows about it, but people know about the, the striped bat or the, uh, the redfish that come in, but it doesn't really get publicized until it's over. Typically, you know, you don't see people saying we got into, you know, 50 bull reds over the past week. It's, Hey, six months ago, here are the pictures, you know, five to eight months ago, here are some pictures that I took of some reds that I caught. So you guys are doing a really good job down there, you know, in Virginia and, and, uh, lower Maryland, keeping the details to yourself. So a little tip of the cap to all of you guys. Yeah, it, it really is a, um, so what I'm talking about is when we find the massive schools and there is a couple other ways that I do fish for them where we're, you know, working for them a little bit more like the guys do down south um, where we can work like uh, Spanish mackerel and bluefish blitzes. We'll find them mixed in with those. We'll find them mixed in with Menhaden uh, schools. You can just, you can work a, a ledge that has a bunch of bait on it and, and find them that way too. You got to grind a little bit harder yeah, uh, and really fish it. Whereas, you know, when we find them in these big schools, when we find them in the big schools, everybody's pretty quiet about it because one boat doing the wrong thing can ruin it for everybody um, for the rest of the day. I mean, if you really 
if you really don't know what you're doing and you go in and you know most of the guys out there know what they're doing they don't scare these fish they know how to get up on them and and keep them in the area and we can have a great day but it happens when somebody comes in and and they can just spook these fish they travel so fast they're they're gone now what's the what are the regulations for redfish in maryland is all catch and release for the ones that we have. Um, uh-huh. There's a slot limit, but but the ones that I get are all over slot, and so everything we're doing is catch and release. Okay, so that's that's where I was going because that's another way to ruin it. You get uh, you get a whole pack of meat hunters out there pulling, you know. I, I and look, guys, I I fish Maryland, but I don't fish Maryland for redfish, but maybe once a year, so I always have to check that. <laughs> So, uh, in Virginia, I don't know what the Virginia limits are. I so rarely get down there. Um, but you know, that's, that's another thing, you know, that's, that's part of the reason why people don't blow up the striper spots when they're going is because you get, you just get a few boats in there that aren't following the rules and it's really going to put a damper on the entire thing. It's tough. It really is tough. Um, and the, the meat hunters that to use your words, um, which yeah. there are several of them out there, they, they try to, they don't, they don't mess with them because they can't put them in their cooler. Right. So those guys are out looking for Spanish mackerel and bluefish um, while we're out hunting down reds. And it really does. Uh, there's, there's really not that many guys doing it to be honest and doing it to do it consistently. It's very difficult. Um, it's right. not an easy fish to find. Um, took me many, many, many years to get them figured out and really find a way to find them consistently. So it's, it's tough. You know, I, I talk about it like it's, there's just redfish boiling all over the place. And, and when you find them, you can find that, but it's a lot of water out there that you got to cover. Right. And, and let me, let me just clarify. When I said meat hunters in this case, I'm talking not about the professionals. <laughs> I'm talking more about the guys who go out and keep everything legal or not. Um, so I, I want to make it clear because if people don't know me, you have to understand I keep fish. I love fish. I will harvest fish all the time. Striped bass. I try to keep it to one a year, but that's my own personal thing. You know, really big tog. If I catch one, you know, that'll probably go back and all the females, but I love to eat tog. I love to eat fluke. I mean, (laughs) I'm going to keep a lot of them this year. So I don't, I don't want anyone to think I'm saying you can't keep anything or I frown on that. I absolutely do not. What I don't like is the guys who go out and they, they're essentially poaching and they're keeping every fish possible. They'll never eat them. They're the guys that empty the freezer at the end of the year and throw all the fish out, you know, because they didn't feel like defrosting something and making it for dinner. They'd rather run out to McDonald's. So that, that's what I meant when I said the meat hunter. Um, I've seen, I've seen big reds on stringers before. It's Yeah. Not yeah, I've, I've seen, I've seen my share of striped bass and, uh, you know, one guy in an inlet, he pulled in a monster and, uh, he couldn't measure it. And I had my kayak and I went up to him and I said, here, and I gave him my bump board. I said, if it's longer than the board, then it's, then you have to throw it back. And it was, gosh, it was at least a foot and a half longer. And he said, so I have to throw this back. I said, yeah. And he said, oh, and I said, and if you don't, it's a huge fine. And if somebody radios ahead and tells them that you're coming in with an illegal fish, they might be waiting for you. He's like, oh. And he's just looking at me like, give me my board back. So he gave me the board back. I pushed off and he, man, he throttled it out of there and headed to the barn so oh. fast. I was like, man, I, I can't stand that. It's like, just throw it back. I mean, there were fish all over. You could have gotten a nice legal one, but that's neither here nor there. I'm sure that you see it on the redfish as well which is, uh, yeah, it's disappointing, but it we happens see a lot while we're out there. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, we've got a couple of questions in here that I want to get to. The first is from be like Mike and you had mentioned the top water, but have you ever had anyone come on and want to catch these bull reds with a fly? I do several fly fishing trips, um, for bull reds a year. Um, it, actually there is a, fly fishing world record that can easily be caught i just haven't haven't had the guy with the fly catch it that fish on my boat but Uh, i see the world record every day and um if for anybody who knows they probably know it better than i do but 
fly fishing world records are, you know, different size tippets and, and all that. So I don't, I don't know if I can't remember which exactly which record it is, but um, yeah, we've got a couple guys hunting that down this year. So maybe I'll do that. I don't know if I have a, I don't know if I, fly rod. you have one. Yeah. I always have a fly rod on the boat. Yeah. I don't know if mine's going to be beefy enough. It's a nine weight. Um, I have a 10. Yeah. A 10. Yeah. The, a 10. I'm thinking it's you still want a, a 10. fight with a 10, but yeah. yeah. Well, that would be interesting to see somebody, maybe if we're out there and we get on them, everyone can just agree that somebody's going to grab that rod and let's see if we can get somebody on a catch of a lifetime. And, and let me, let me ask you this. When you're on one of those blitzes and you have all those fish around, do you need to know how to cast that fly really well? Or is it one of those things where you can just kind of roll cast it out there and you're, it's right in the frenzy and you're good. It, depending on who's around, if you know, if there's a bunch of other boats around and we got to be thoughtful of them, you right. might want to cast, but if we got them all to ourselves and we want to be selfish and catch a nice fish on the fly we can run right into the school and all you have to do is drop your fly off the side of the boat yeah. um because we have them i mean they bounce off the boat for anybody who's seen my my uh social media i'm sure you've seen the the videos of literally big fit redfish bouncing off the boat yeah so, why don't you share your social media right now just so that people can <laughs> check it out afterwards and then share it again at the end because i have looked yeah. at that repeatedly and uh probably it's unhealthy with how much I've looked at these. I'm, I'm now more than obsessed with these fish. It is. It's, it's insane. Um, Griffin's guide service. So at Griffin's on Instagram, it's Griffin's underscore guide underscore service um, and Griffin's guide service on Facebook. You can find those videos and pictures both places. And uh, it's incredible stuff. I, I pinch myself every day for, for the stuff I see out there. And, and my clients just can't believe it. It's yeah, because it's rare, you know, it's rare that people actually get on things like that. And, uh, uh, that's why when we were talking before the last time you were on, you said, wait, do, wait, do we talk about redfish someday? And then you gave us the taste of it, or you gave me the taste of it before you came on. And I was like, yeah, that we've got to have you back. And you're and for have, those watching, I tried to get him to come back immediately. And, and Steve's like, now, why don't we wait until it gets a little closer? <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's probably a good idea. Get a little bit more excited. Now yeah. I have to, you know, so few people really know about it. Um, I've got guys that fish the bay and even the portions of the bay that I fish for redfish their entire lives. I'm talking 50 years. I've got guys that come on and fish the bay for 50 years and they, I didn't even know those fish were here and yeah. we're they're here enough that we can go out and target them successfully every day during, during the summer. So that's the um, important thing. And I do think it's getting, it's getting better every year. Yeah. We're starting to see, I, I think they're just pushing further and further North. We're seeing yeah. more and more in New Jersey. And that actually brings us into the next question. This one from uh, Hunter Hines. How far north do the big schools of Reds get up in the bay? Good question. Um, furthest I have seen them with my own eyes is um, the Chester River, Love Point. So all the way up above the Bay Bridge. So above really? Annapolis. Um, I actually saw them, you know, not a school of them, but we were fishing up there in the fall and we were fishing next to a pound net up there. And the guys working the pound nets pulled a big redfish out of that net, threw it, threw it back. Wow. So that's the furthest I've seen them. I don't target them that far up. Um, I probably target them further up than just about anybody. I'm not going to say how far I target them, but uh, they get out. You'd be surprised. Um, they act differently as they get further up the bay, though. You're not going to find the big schools um, further up. You're going to, okay. but you can find them, um, you know, a couple small groups or just lone rangers out there and you got to fish for them a little bit different. Yeah. I can say I, I do fish for reds up towards that area close to the narrows. Um, mm -hmm. but I'm not looking for the big guys. I'm just looking for the ones that are, you know, moving in solo. And to me, it's a long shot, uh, but I, I'm surprised up at the Chester River, you, you're seeing yep. larger ones up there. I was, and I think that was two years ago. Um, 
Oh, so so I was like surprised to see it further. too. I couldn't couldn't believe my eyes. Wow. But um, yeah, that was about two years ago. All right. Well, that answers that. That is uh, Great that's some good information. That that gives a lot of hope to people that don't travel as far or are coming from further north. That you know, if you want a shot, you can get down into there. You know, you can get into at least a shot at them once you start. So a, a lot of guys, a lot of guys catch them by accident south of there. Um, yeah. You know, guys fishing for Spanish mackerel, they will come up into a, a bluefish blitz or a mackerel blitz um, or even a rockfish blitz. I've caught, I have actually caught a rockfish, reeled, started reeling it in, then felt a bump. My drag went screaming. That rockfish was let go or whatever was big, let go. And, and I reeled in a rockfish with no scales on it. And it had to have been a red because that's really the only big thing in that area at that time. Right. <laughs> it wasn't a shark. It would have been bit in half. But, um, yeah, so so they're in there in the mix um, more than people think. Wow. Yeah, I you know, there's a lot of people that say, well, th this fish isn't here. It's not there. Well, have you tried? Have you even tried for it? Because it's when you don't try and it becomes – it kind of becomes law. You know, there's, there's no, and here's a good example. It used to be, there's no more sheep's head in New Jersey. And it just became true until somebody started fishing for them. And now it's not uncommon at all to pull out a 10, 12, 14 pound, you know, sheep's head from the bridges all the way through all of New Jersey, all the way up to the tip of New Jersey. And, uh, you know, you see them in New York, you know, the, yeah. that they're catching them, but, but it used to be the truth that they weren't around that you couldn't catch them but uh it turns out you could what you got to put you got to put the effort in and yeah. really fish them hard and and i didn't have a choice drew and i actually back when we had real jobs um we could only fish after work or on weekends yeah. and fishing weekends is just too crowded up that way um so after work during the weekdays we would go out and really really fish hard because we knew they were there we had accidentally caught them before we knew they were there. So we wanted to focus on trying to target them and really get them. Um, and we found a few, you know, found what to look for and how to get them. Um, and a couple top secret uh, things that only people that come on my boat know, but that uh, there, there's definitely, if you fish it hard you think outside the box or look to other regions. Uh, I do that all the time. Salt Strong's a great place. They've got guys from down south, guys from all over up your way. And uh, I do that all the time. I look to all those other guys and see how they are fishing for things. Because a lot of people really just look at what everybody's doing in their area. Right. And then yeah. everybody's going to catch the same stuff because they're all doing the same thing. Yeah. So you change, yeah. you change it up a little bit. Look what other guys are doing maybe in Louisiana or, or, uh, down in the Carolinas and, and you might learn something. Yeah. A good example. Uh, again, another New Jersey example, you, you get people that they believe there's no big fluke in Southern New Jersey. So South of Atlantic city can't catch them. And it's because they drift the same channels that everyone else is drifting. Like there were 50 boats there nobody caught anything. I'm like, yeah, because you were 30 yards over. F yep. don't fish where everybody else is don't do the same thing all the time change it up a little bit and you're going to start catching some nice fish and the guys that catch the nice fish and are winning the tournaments are the guys that are fishing 30 yards off of the other guys and the people don't even realize they think they're in the same spot they don't realize they're they're in different spots they're fishing it differently now there's a question in here from ben uh crabbing and fishing which is pretty good can you talk more about depths and structure when you're out there hunting for these fish Structure, I, I could, I personally consider structure, you know, ledges a structure because that is underwater structure, yeah. and specifically for bull reds, that is the structure I'm looking for. Um, and I have found these fish anywhere from four feet of water, three foot of water, to forty feet of water, and this is different in in you know all different areas of the bay. Um, they act, like I said, multiple times, they, they act differently. Just a five mile, you know, you, you head five miles North and you're not, they're not going to do the same thing. 
Right. And it, they do it every year. I don't know what it is, but they act differently in certain parts of the bay. Um, the I would say the majority of the fish we catch are probably 30 foot of water. Okay. And ledges. So 30 feet of water and ledges is a good starting point. Yep. And that it, it and to be honest, I start from scratch every day. These fish are almost impossible to pattern. Um, so you really just have to go look for fishy areas with structure, ledges, um, and cover a lot of ground. It's nothing for me to put 90 miles on the boat in one trip. Now, is it, let me ask you this. Okay. They're tough to pattern on a day in day out basis. So today versus tomorrow, is there a pattern that you look for season wide? So generally in the first third, they're going to be doing X, they're going to be doing Y in the middle third and then Z at the end. Yes. And that's, that goes right back to how they act differently as they move up. So right. as they hit those points, um, they, you know, as they get further up, they start to spread out and you're not going to see the big schools of them. So they definitely act a little bit different. Um, there is certain parts of the bay where the majority of the time, or if you're going to see blitzes, they're going to be in that area the most um, in the middle bay. You're not going to see that further up. Um, right. And even south in Virginia, I think um, really actively feeding schools of fish in my experience, some guys down in Virginia, I don't fish Virginia that much, but in my experience, you know, usually those fish are just, if you see them on the surface, they're kind of just cruising and right. not really blitzing. Um, I have seen it down there, but they, they act completely different as they make their way up the bay. Yeah. I talked to a captain in uh, Virginia a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about you coming on to do this. And he mentioned, he's like, oh, I'm looking forward to, to that one. He's like, cause we've got our little thing going on down here. I'm like, how come nobody's talking about that one either? He's like, people are talking, but they're doing the same thing as the, as the Maryland guys. They're, they're, they're only giving out enough to, so that people can go out and put in their own time and figure it out on their own. He's like, but we've got a really nice one, but smaller than what they seem to be getting a little bit further North. So I wonder if these big schools are just kind of jetting through the lower bay and then really becoming active and schooling up as they get into the middle bay. I don't know. What do you think? They, no, because there are uh, even Oceanside, there are some huge, massive schools of fish. Um, and I've seen them coming right through the mouth of the bay in massive schools. But um, I think we have them, like you said, they're passing through down there. Right. To come here. So so where we're at, I think we get them a lot longer and they kind of they kind of all come together up here and they do spread out a little bit. You know, like I said, you'll see some spread out, go a little bit further up. And but the big schools of them, you know, for about two months, we get them pretty solid. Two months starting around when? July. We start we start looking for them in July and we'll have them okay. before then. Um, and then I kind of, I only go when I really know that I'm going to get them. Sure. I mean, and well, it makes I, sense. You know, you don't for like a business. I might be able to, I could probably go find a redfish in Maryland right now. Right. I wouldn't be surprised, but, um, to really target them and, and make sure I put my clients on, on a good trip. Yeah. I mean, there's a big difference, you know, going out with your buddy because you have a quote unquote real job and you only have a few hours is a lot different than, you know, six guys jumping on, trying to get on some fish, you know, you got to be very careful in that case, uh, exactly. unless they come on and say, look, I, we don't care. We just want the chance. Um, I've I, had that. We, yeah. I'm that, that type of person. Week. Yeah. I would, I would probably do that, but I, it would be difficult to put a whole charter together of six guys that are like, Hey, if we only catch one fish, we're, we're happy. Uh, <laughs> it's a tough way to run a business. Very difficult. Especially um, when they they, they hear the other stories, you know, right? They hear the stories and they want, they want to see that. Well, you said, you know, the smallest one was 41. So you've kind of, you've kind of put the pressure on yourself with that one. I, I mean, that's, that's, that's just how it is up here. Yeah. That's just how it is. And it's been that way for, for many, many years. I would say a 48 inch redfish is our cookie cutter redfish. We catch more 48s than anything else, which is, uh, I mean, 
I, it's incredible. I mean, I, I don't even know how I'm saying this, but yeah. it's the truth. I was going to say, uh, I'll take a 48. I'll take a 40. <laughs> I'll take a 35. <laughs> You're talking uh, about somebody who hasn't caught any bull reds. The biggest red I caught, I think it was 29. And uh, that was in, you know, it was in a foot of water in Pamlico Sound, which is really the only place that I've ever really focused on redfish. So, you know, anything over fun. 29. I, I enjoy doing that. You know, I'm spoiled up here. I get to do it every day with these big bulls. So going shallow water on a pulling skiff or something is, is the you know, the grass is greener on the other side to me. I love shallow water fishing, but there is no doubt that what we have going on up here is the Holy grail to most people. Yeah. It's one of those special areas, special opportunities. You got to take advantage of it. Definitely. No doubt. So we had a, another question. So to Roger, yes, we did go through the gear. So you can, you can check that out after you can go back. But one thing I want to go back to the lure. So you talked about the Z-Man diesel in seven inch. You talked about the GI jigs and the half ounce up to one and a half, but you're typically going with the one and a half. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you would use? Let's say you're out there and you know, it's, it's just out there for fun. You're not doing a charter and you're just out tossing things around. What other types of lures would you bring with you when you're heading out looking for these bulls? So when I go out there, um, I will take some big top water lures, um, spooks, chuggers, um, anything will work. Like I said, when they're on, if they're going to eat top water, they'll eat anything. Right. Um, so as long as you got strong hooks, you're good to go. Um, the other thing I'm always on these trips, I'm always rigged with a whole nother set of rods. And that is for when we run into, because it's almost a guarantee that we run into a blitz of bluefish or Spanish mackerel. So, um, I always have those rods rigged up and I put, you can tell I like GI jigs cause he just makes the best products, but these are rain minnows. And this is what we throw at Spanish mackerel and bluefish. Cause this is, I've got a couple other colors, but this is exactly, looks exactly like the bait yeah. that these fish are eating. And believe it or not, the redfish will eat these too. Um, I've caught so many redfish casting into blues and max and caught them on these. Um, so really these fish aren't, aren't picky. Um, and that's when we get into the, to the blitzes. Um, I will use popping corks. LJ with GI jigs made me specifically made me a, um, heavy duty hook with a lighter jig head and this okay. is this will work perfectly with a popping cork i'm sure, sure most of you have seen this so and i run on on the back of that i'll run a seven inch or a five inch diesel minnow okay that's the rig right there um and you got to go so obviously with a popping cork you got to go down in weight or else it'll just weigh that popping cork down um, the other thing that's great in shallow water, um, like I said, every once in a while, we, we do get a time and a place where we can get them in very shallow water. And that's also where that lighter head works numbers. I'm going to hope paddle tails. I mean, generally we're seeing these fish on Medhaden. And so these big paddle tails have a great profile. They hold up very well. And that's why they're my choice. Yeah. They, I mean, they've got such an aggressive tail on them too. They're putting out a ton of vibration. Oh, they, they let everybody, they let every fish around know that they're there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're, we're coming up on 45 minutes. I want to keep making sure that I get some of these other questions in here. This is an opinion question for you. Are reds good eating? So I've heard. Yes. I've never had them. Not really, <laughs> I am not a lot of people. So everybody, I, just, I blow everybody's mind with this, but I am not a big seafood eater. I love crabs, uh -huh. but I do not, you know, I don't eat fish hardly at all. Even though I'm a fisherman, I love the sport and I love going out and finding fish and catching fish, but I would rather eat a steak any day. Um, I have my friends and, and Drew, 
Um, my other captain will eat fish, and he goes into the shallows and catches a lot of slot reds. Yeah, and uh, he'll tell you that that they probably taste better than stripers. Uh, I well, I'll agree with that. Yeah, I do. As I mentioned before, I like to eat fish, and and see if you'll be happy to know that one of our salt strong fishing coaches, amazing at catching fish all over the Gulf, the the, the East Coast, all you know, the Chesapeake. Pat Ogletree does not eat fish at all. So. See? <laughs> Maybe these fish know that that we won't eat them, so they'll let us hook them or something. We'll yeah, it just works out. They know that it's a catch and release charter, so they're That's like, right. "All right, what the heck? I'll bite that diesel. <laughs> let me bite that thing. Give this guy a little show, and and then I'll go back to my friends." I I will tell you, I like I do like redfish. Um, I only kept a couple in my life and released everything else, but uh, the couple that I kept were definitely uh, definitely good. But again, they were in slot. So they were smaller and I don't know if it's true for redfish or not, but it seems to me that for most species, the smaller fish have a better taste to them and a better consistency to the meat than the larger. I mean, I don't even know if redfish can get worms like black drum, uh, but you know, certainly you don't want to keep the monster black drum. You want to keep the, uh, the puppies They're They're the ones that are going to taste better. Yeah. I, th I think that goes for anything. The longer they've been in the water, the more chance they have to, have problems with them. Right, right. We got another question in here from Spencer Frey. How does the tide play into targeting the reds? Big time. Um, for stripers, I can almost like clockwork predict when the stripers are going to eat. It's, a, it's almost a guarantee. Um, reds, a little bit more difficult. Like I said, they're harder to pattern. They kind of do whatever they want whenever they want. But... I have been able to predict using tides which way those fish would be moving or where I would find feeding fish. Um, so I think like anything, they like moving water. They like current. Now, do you find that during the, the big swings and tides that that has any negative impact on them? Or do you think that it's, well, again, these are open water, so maybe it's a little bit different, but do you see anything, you know, full moon? Is it any different than it is for a, you know, a quarter moon? Full moon, they do act differently. Um, and, but what they'll do is, and I'm pinching myself, or I'm a little mad at myself that I haven't paid more attention to this and I plan on doing it this year. I really want to try and, you know, we found out how to really find them. And now I really want to find out why we're finding them where. Um, so I really want to keep getting better at this and try to put some sort of uh, pattern to them, moon phase and with all that. Um, but they definitely, moon phase, I think they'll move shallow. If you get a full moon, they'll move shallow. But a lot of that has to do with crabs. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, that's a very good point because they're going to be on, a lot of people, you know, even with striped bass, they think you know, crabs aren't a bait. Oh, no, they're a great bait. They're a great no, bait for them. Up. I actually have a uh, a bait that I want to try on these reds, uh, it but but it won't work unless it is shallower water. So I'm kind of hoping we do get something up in the in the shallower areas so I can try out a couple of things. Of course, the other five guys are going to be like, "Rich, shut up, get up to the front of the boat, leave us alone. We're we're busy." But I'm I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, uh, it can be. You know, I talk. It, it is a grind almost every day. You know, there are days where. We came out, you know, it was one day, I, one of my buddies I grew up with, known him since first grade is when I met him. And he, he came on a redfish charter with me last year and brought his family. And we came around the corner and we were running south. And he goes, are you, are you going to run over that sandbar up there? I said, Josh, that's not a sandbar. That is a school of fish blitzing on the surface. He thought it was a sandbar because he saw the waves. Yeah. The white water. And, um, you know, sometimes we get lucky like that, but a lot of the times we're out there for eight hours, you know, searching for these things. It is a needle in the haystack. Yeah. But what a great, what a great fun way to spend the day on the water searching for it, you know? Yeah. And, and like I said, we can break it up. We almost always see redfish or um, almost always see redfish, but we almost always see bluefish and mackerel, which is always fun to tug on. And that's why we always are ready to, to catch those two. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting you said that they will actually mix in together. 
certain parts of the bay. When we're, it's it's funny because when we're looking for the big schools, I don't think I've ever in those parts of the bay caught them in mackerel or bluefish schools. But as they get further up, I do all the time. That's interesting. So it's kind of like okay, it's kind of like the striped bass. They'll they'll be with bluefish or well, usually have bluefish on the outside of them um weak fish underneath if you're in the right spot at the right mm -hmm. time um but here's a question from gi jigs have you ever seen the bulls breaking on the spanish mackerel and feeding on them i have seen so actually take it back to the very first bull redfish i caught i cast it into a school of spanish mackerel jumping out of the water with a diesel minnow and as soon as it hit the water i was tight on a bull red so you see tons of chaos and this was an area where it's not you know this was an area where there was there's not big schools of redfish um but so they're certainly in there yes and lj lj with gi jigs knows this as good as anybody yeah yeah oh man i i I can't wait. I can't wait. So when you're out there, um, what other species would you expect to be getting? Or is, or le actually, let me ask it this way. If you're out there on the water and you're looking for these and you're not you, so me, I'm out there on a boat and I'm out there just kind of looking around. Is there any kind of sign that I want to look for up on the surface? Is there any other type of fish I want to locate first? Um, what, what types of things, what types of factors come together, which really make you think, okay, I don't know if they're here, but this is likely a decent spot to stop and start looking for these reds. I'll break it down into, um, let's talk in the Maryland portion. So we'll talk the north side first. When I'm up further north in Maryland and I'm looking for redfish, I'm looking for schools in Menhaden just rolling on the surface. I'm looking for, there could be uh, stripers, there could be bluefish, Spanish mackerel. I'm looking for any kind of life I can find. Because like I said, they are, they are really scarce, but they're there. And they're right. there enough that you can target them because um, these fish come to commotion. Um, so I'm looking for any kind of life, anything making noise. And I'm going to look really hard in those areas. I'm looking for ledges. Um, I will scan ledges. I, I run really good side imaging. All my electronics is top notch. So I can see these fish out pretty far on side imaging. Um, and a single redfish will show up. It's a big fish. Yeah. So he's not getting by me. Um, now, further south, when you're looking for the needle in a haystack, I start getting very excited when I see slicks on the water. And then we call it watermelon, but you can actually smell these fish. Um, everybody's probably had that, got into a big school of, you know, actively feeding fish and you take it you get a smell and i see you looking everybody doesn't believe me but you're gonna you're gonna find out oh no i i absolutely know what you're talking okay. about i okay. can't tell you how many times we've stopped the boat and people are just looking at each other like, i smell them and yep. people are like no you don't it's like yeah you literally can smell them uh joey it, leggio is talking about you smell licorice in certain it, times of the year and that's where you know to stop yeah it is it literally we call it watermelon but it literally hits you in the face um when you get into them or near them and there's, there's no denying it. And when I start smelling them, I start getting very excited and I start looking around really hard in those areas. Yeah. Um, slicks too. Slicks on the surface is a huge sign. These, uh, these fish will, will put a big slick on the water. Um, other than that, you got to find them with sonar. Um, there's really not much else showing you where they are in the big open water um, in the big schools, but you can generally find the area they are at or have been in by smelling or looking for slicks. Okay. So when you're out there, I, I you know, I think a lot of people, myself included think, all right, you're going to see them boiling on the surface, but what percentage of the time are you actually seeing them up top versus finding them by looking at all the other clues in the electronics? The last year was, was crazy and it, it was nothing like any other year. Last year, I would say 25% of the time they were on top. 
maybe, maybe 20. Okay. Um, okay. But the majority of the fish we catch, we're finding with sonar. Okay. And there's still active blitz underneath. You just can't see them. They're eating. Um, I guess that's where the slick comes from. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, they might be cruising. They might just be cruising by. I, I got on them. Um, actually had a cancellation. Poor guy. Canceled last minute um, last year. And so I decided to take my wife and my then one-year-old son out, one-and-a-half-year-old son out. And um, we found them almost right away in the afternoon. We left our boat. I turned the boat off when we got on them. And both her and I caught three redfish without turning the motors back on. And we had them under the boat the entire time. Wow. That only happens when nobody else is around. Yeah. And these fish aren't really moving or chasing bait. So I think those fish were just kind of in that area cruising around. Um, but yeah, we put six big redfish on the boat without even turning the key. That's a day, man. That we're is by ourselves. You got to be for that to happen. You got to be by yourself. They're smart. Yeah. We got to put this comment up here from Amy. Just watch the video on your Facebook of a whole boat of people hooked up to bull reds. It's the coolest thing I've ever seen. I've seen that video and i agree that is one of the coolest things i've ever seen talk about mayhem we call you know? it the it's braided line limbo i mean yeah. you got those reds go wherever they want they're going to take a couple really hard runs and uh it's up to everybody on the boat to uh you know duck and weave and yeah. go over go under it's it's so much fun you know when you're with a good crew and an experienced crew when they don't get upset when that starts happening Every once in a while you're on the boat and somebody gets really upset when you're casting over them and, and all that. And you're like, that's how you have to do it, man. <laughs> you can't it's just, mayhem. you don't have your own little spot anymore. There's mayhem going on. You got to kind of, you got to start dancing the dance with everybody else. So I give everybody a talk when we're on our way out, everybody that comes on a redfish trip with me and I call it the fire drill because, you know, it could be slow. You can get bored. You might you know, it might be a couple hours we're looking for these fish, but when we find them, you better have a rod close to your hand. You better be ready to throw. And, um, you know, don't be afraid to throw over top of somebody or think about it. You don't want to, you don't right. want to mess with anybody, but, um, yeah, usually almost every one of my trips is a private trip. I don't run hardly any walk-ons with redfish. So yeah, you don't have to worry about guys not knowing each other. Everybody seems to work together and they're all either family or best friends. Yeah. And I think that's the thing when you're out there. Yes, you can throw over somebody, but it's because you're working together because you know what you got to know where they tossed first. You have to know where their bait is going. So if it's, if the current is going to take it towards the back, well, then you can toss over them up towards the front, knowing that they're sweeping under you right now. And you're now yeah. up top by the time they bring it in, they're going to be able, you're going to be under them now. You know, and they can toss out over top of you. So it you have to coordinate it. And I say it's the fire drill, but you have to think about what you're doing first. You got to take a second to think, okay, they were here. Let's throw back here at the back of the boat. And I, the whole time, I'm I'm just calling out, trying to coach people into the into the bite. Right. You know, let it leave your bail open. Let it drop for five seconds. Close your bail. You're going to be hooked up. Or yeah. <laughs> or you know, throw it out, reel it back as fast as you can across the top, or let it fall all the way to the bottom and then bring it up. You know, there's, it's, it's really is, it's a fire drill. Um, you gotta be quick, gotta be quick and you gotta be, yeah. you know, do it right. But. All right. We've got two, we've got time for two more questions. The first one is a quick one. When you're out there and you find the fish on the electronics, it's not an active bite. They're just kind of cruising around or they're staging along a ledge or in a certain area. Are you ever putting scents on those lures when you throw them out or are you just throwing out the regular plastic? Great question. I try to use Procure almost every time I go out. Okay. Um, the Mid Hayden flavor, okay. even I mean for everything, I do it for big stripers. I do it for big redfish. I think it only I know for a fact with stripers it makes a difference. Yes, redfish like I say they eat anything, but it can only help. So we we try to do everything that we can to to get that bite. Right. All <laughs> right. So I'm in agreement with that. I definitely am. Uh, Throwing scent on everything I can. Love Procure. Uh, Salt Strong has the saltwater blend of the Dr. Juice, which also works really well. And uh, Smelly Jelly is another one that I've used in the past. But when I have nothing left, 
I throw that regular shutter oil. That's my backup. I have a, a thing of that in, in the, the kayak and I'll throw that out there just so you have some scent on there. Right. All right. And here's the last one. This is, we're at an hour. So, but I have to get this one in. So let's say you have those six fish hooked up and you know, you're drifting and you're now trying to manage six fish into the boat. You get all of them landed. Now you've released all the fish nice and safe. Everyone got their, their quick pictures. How are you going to relocate that school that you just came off of? Probably the best question of the night because I still ask myself that question. Um, but the best thing I have to go off of is one, I'm looking for some new uh, sonar technology to tell me that. Yeah. If we might have that on the boat by this, you know, by the season comes, but uh, two, typically all the fish are going to run in one direction. And I've come to find that, you know, everybody hooks up and it, almost every time everybody's fighting their fish on the same side of the boat or the back yeah. of the boat, or they're on the front of the boat. Um, and that's because they're running with the schools. They're trying to stay in that school. So my first go-to is to go, you know, keep in mind they ran East <clears throat> once we get everything released and and everything's good to go or cleaned up i'm going east okay and you're talking their initial run their first run is in the direction of the school you believe typically yeah I, I, well okay. i think they try to run to the school almost every run because they okay they really don't well a couple of them will you know, take you around the world around the boat right. but um that's when they get closer so yeah they're especially their initial run i'm paying very close attention to that that's a great answer. That's a great answer. I wasn't sure how you'd answer that. And I don't know how I would have answered that. I think I just would have been like, I don't know. I just kind of guess. Look I've, at the electronics, look at the chart and see where I think I was, you know, a minute and, ago, five minutes ago. And I started doing that until, um, you know, just time on the water, I was able to see you know, all my lines are going this way. And then all of a sudden another boat pulls up and they're over there towards where my lines are. Unfortunately, sometimes they get a little too close to me. Yeah. Um, we've had that problem because these fish do take some long runs and we get a lot of line out. But um, yeah, almost every time, like if I see people hook up, they're, they're over that way. That's a great answer. That's awesome. Uh, well, we are at the hour. So I, I mean, I could talk forever. We're, we're not going to do that tonight. I know you could. <laughs> I, I could talk. And we about didn't even have things. pictures to throw up for this one. We 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 should have done that. We'll have to do that for another one at some point. Maybe we'll have you back on when we do the shakedown afterwards of uh, how we did on that day out on the water, and uh, and we'll go through a recap and we can make fun of everybody for doing well or not doing well. And I'll say right now, typically I'm the one who doesn't do well when it's a charter. So. <laughs> You'll be the one guy who missed, huh? Yeah, I probably, <laughs> I probably will. But uh, yeah, it, it's very possible. But um, before we go, one last time, do you want to give all of your contact information for your your service and your socials? Yep, um, Griffin's Guide Service. I am Captain Steve Griffin. Um, you can reach me through our website, griffinsguideservice.com, or Griffin's underscore guide underscore service on instagram um griffin's guide service on facebook and all those places you can easily reach me um i try to get back to everybody as fast as possible awesome well thank you very much again for coming on really appreciate it and uh everyone thanks for tuning in tonight we're going to announce our guests for next week in a couple of days I wanted to let you know that uh, I'm, I was watching the chat and there are a few New Jersey guys who have canceled their trips for tomorrow. I totally get it. It's not going to be comfortable or safe. Although you do have some people in there like I took the day off already. I'm going. So good luck to all of you guys in New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland that are out there trying to get on those early season flounder or fluke as they're called uh, up north. Best of luck to all of you. Looking forward to seeing those reports in the community if you're an insider member. So next, next week, again, we'll let you know at the end of this week who's coming on. So until then, everyone, get out there, get on the water, and get some tight lines. <laughs>